Okay, uh, so in this talk, um, I'm going to do three things in particular. And the first is to explain the logistics cycle, request acquisition and distribution, the voyage to the peninsula, the bases and the administration and the lines of communication. I bound that up in one. The second is to discuss the process of disembarkation and distribution. And the third is to look at some issues of artillery ammunition. Now, this is not just specific to artillery, because artillery, pieces and ammunition came the exact same way that everything was done. So uh, this is more about processes and uh, the end product happens to be a gun or a shell. In the words of Britain's senior logistics officer during the First World War, the logistics system in place at Gallipoli was abnormal and peculiar. Everything required for living and fighting had to come by sea. And at nearly 3,500 sea miles between England and Gallipoli, General Sir Ian Hamilton, who commanded the Mediterranean Expeditionary Force, referred to the route as the biggest and most difficult since the day of Xerxes. At Gallipoli, the logistics cycle began in the theatre, and it differed greatly from that employed on the Western Front. There was a pool logistics system where every unit submitted um, its uh, request to General Headquarters based on what it thought it would require uh, in the future. GHQ then forwarded those, and you can see the cycle here, forwarded those on to the War Office um, for stores that went to one individual, for supplies that went to another. Um, uh, after that uh, material it is acquired um, by the War Office, um, it's then it goes through a whole other process of getting this material, transporting it to the ports of embarkation, which requires quite a lot of collaboration and cooperation with the Navy. And, and that does not work well at all uh, at this stage of the First World War, both because of processes, it's not clear and where responsibilities begin and end, and also because of con uh, pers uh, personalities. And I don't have time to touch on that here in this talk, but maybe we can even get question time. So the idea, and you see the last, uh, section here is that the Navy is then responsible once they get once the army gets it to the ports of embarkation the Navy is responsible for loading that onto the ships and taking it to the theatre. And the idea is to load it in bulk um, putting as few items in, in one ship as possible. And it didn't always work like that we hear of that in the lead up to the April landings. The same thing is still happening in the waters. Upon leaving the UK and you can see that on, on the map here the ship sailed across the Bay of Biscay um, and then went to Gibraltar and Malta and then onto the main logistic base at Alexandria. On rare occasions and only when there was a great urgency, a dual line of communications was opened up uh, from, uh, from France uh, and that shortened the distance by over 2,000 sea miles. But that was a very rare uh, occasion that occurred. So this entire voyage is subject to weather obviously, German submarines and uh, particularly delays at all these ports of call and the difficulties of supplying the MEF were described by uh, one officer as beyond description or possibility of exaggeration. Now Gibraltar and Malta as you see there um, are merely ports of call and Alexandria uh, which is on the top image here was the MEF's main base and almost all shipping from the UK was sent to Alexandria. It had wharves, it had piers, it had jetties, railway lines and cranes for unloading. And it was here that stores, uh, or everything, had to be disembarked, resorted, repacked and reloaded before forwarding onto uh, the intermediate base at New Drossava, which you saw on that previous slide. So this was a, a timely process and it, it caused considerable delay throughout. Due to the German submarine menace, ships over 1,500 ton were prevented from travelling direct from Alexandria to the Gallipoli Peninsula. Instead, they had to go to Mudros Harbour, um, where again they would transfer their cargoes onto smaller craft because these were less vulnerable uh, to, to submarines on the approach to the peninsula. Um, and, and it's at Mudros that the greatest delay occurs on the lines of communication. There's a whole bunch of reasons, again, we don't have time to go into the details, but one is a lack of port facilities, there's basically nothing including deep water piers. There's congestion, 
there's so many ships at this harbour, they're bumping into each other. Uh, there's a lack of available labour to both load and unload through the transshipping process. There's a lack of small craft to do any of this work. There's, an, as I said, an absence of deep water piers and a lack of facilities on the island on which to store any kind of equipment. So they create floating depots, which are converted store ships, uh, on which they put everything, and then it's transshipped through that process. The problem with this, or one of the problems, is that most of those ships that arrived at Mudros did so without a manifest, and so it wasn't possible to tell what was on board, or to prioritise which ships should be unloaded first. It was not uncommon for supply ships to remain un unemptied for weeks on end or to be sent away before being cleared. And there is an example with the August Offensive. There's a 15 inch howitzer, one in the theatre, the largest uh, range of any gun in the theatre. Uh, it sits on a ship and uh, it doesn't get unloaded. By the time they figure out where it is, it's no longer required. The pressures faced at Mudros were partially uh, relieved by the smaller advanced base at Kefalos Harbour on, on Imbros Island. It was closer to the peninsula, but it was mainly used as a thoroughfare for those ships that came from Mudros on the way to the peninsula. They could duck in there, um, it was protected, and then they could make the voyage to the peninsula at night, under the cover of darkness, and offering them protection from both submarines and enemy artillery fire as they approached it and lay off the beaches. So through this process, the Royal Navy were able to deliver between three to 400 tonnes to the peninsula each day. Now, General C. Ian Hamilton's estimate was that if the August offensive succeeded, we were requiring up to 2,000 tonnes a day uh, using the same process that I've just described. Now, the administration is really complex, um, and, and this doesn't do it justice. Uh, there's about 5,000 words on it. But really, there's no fewer than six individual naval officers re responsible for the various parts of naval transport, and some have overlapping roles. And the Army's logistic process or its system was theoretically less complex, but certainly no more efficient in practice. In effect, the Inspector General of Communications, who is responsible for the line of communication, um, he relies on ships, and he relies on cooperation with the Navy, and you know, there's all good means here, but field service regulations, the manual of combined naval and military operations don't make it clear of where responsibilities begin and end between the services. As is the case in most amphibious campaigns, the real difficulties were faced in getting stores and supplies and guns in this case, um, uh, ashore, organising the beach maintenance area and then distributing these items forward. None of the three main beaches, and you can see them here, that made up the advanced bases were logistically suitable. You've got Cape, uh, W Beach and Cape Ellers in the south, Anzac Cove, which we're all familiar with, and Suvla Bay to the north. The Naval Chief of Staff complained about this, noting that lack of space for safe storage in the vicinity of the beaches was frequently given as a reason for refusing to accept stores. And it was also given as a reason for not accepting more artillery pieces. There was simply no room particularly at Anzac, to store it and then to create gun emplacements. Adding to the delay was this, uh, was this confusion. So we've had confusion all on the lines of communications. There's confusion again when it comes to disembarkation between which army and which navy officers are responsible for which part. Once disembarked at the beach, the various supplies were stockpiled generally at locations chosen by the Corps' senior uh, administrative officer, and then the forward distribution was organised at the divisional level. With the exception of water, which was moved forward by mules, everything else, including art artillery uh, ammunition, was collected by the units and carried uphill back to their positions. The MEF, like the British Expeditionary Force on the Western Front, was restric restricted in its access to ammunition in 1915. Proportionately, there was less ammunition available at Gallipoli than on the Western Front. No surprises there, given the statistics I uh, gave in my first talk. That said, that said, sorry, the artillery ammunition supplies available for the August Offensive was in excess of what had previously been available. The 9th Battery, the 3rd Australian Field Artillery Brigade, for example, fired more rounds in August of 1915 than the previous three months combined. 
this sort of supply could not be maintained. There was a shell shortage on the Western Front, where, of course, uh, the, the majority of the shells went. And British industry, and this is the important point, because the Dardanelles is usually blamed for taking away ammunition and being responsible for the shortage at, 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 on the Western Front. No, the problem is British industry. No one foresaw this war lasting as long as it did. Industry hadn't geared up yet. Product production had not caught up to demand. Despite the overall increase in ammunition sent to the Dardanelles, <coughs> this predominantly came in shrapnel rounds. And as we've heard, shrapnel is little value um, in, in the offensive operations and the sort of terrain you're facing at Anzac, particularly um, given that it's designed for firing the troops on the open and can't destroy the last paragraph here. Can't destroy those defences. Now this is problematic given the, the destructive purpose of a 1915 artillery barrage which is to destroy obstacles and keep the enemy in their trenches until the attacking troops arrive. And the only time in the York's defence that this works is at home time. The only successful Australian action of the entire world campaign. The first supplies of 18 pounder high explosive shells did not arrive in the Anzac sector until the 2nd of August. And they only had 150 rounds per battery. Prior to August, only 11 high explosive rounds, the 18 pounder shells, had been fired in total at Cape Ellis, 11 rounds. So it was not long before stocks became depleted. By the 12th of August, the 10 pounder mountain guns, which are in support of the Anzacs, have 50 rounds left on the lines of communication. 50. And there's messages coming down that you need to husband your uh, resources. You can't just be firing off. So they're just some of the logistic problems faced at the middle of August, and I think we'll stop there, uh, and we can we can talk about this more in